Hey guys, today Big Daddy and I are going to take you and explore Oklahoma, Mississippi and the Battle of Oklahoma. You know, soldiers camped in and around the field behind me and the one across the highway as well. Civil War artifacts have been found, things like bullets and uh, pots and cooking utensils. This is, this is about two or three miles from Egypt, Mississippi, as crow flies. Come along, let's go explore. In January of 1864, Union General William Sweet Smith and his cavalry was to come down from Memphis on the line of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, their target being the breadbasket or the prairie of Northeast Mississippi. General Smith was to destroy as much of the property, storehouses, and railroads from Oklahoma to Meridian as he could without getting drawn into a major engagement before he linked up with General Sherman and his 20,000 Federals. Union General Smith had around 7,200 troops moving through New Albany when General Forrest learned of his presence. Forrest then orders his brother, Colonel Jeffrey Forrest, to move from Grenada back to West Point. And he positioned various other troops so as to trap the Federals in and around the rivers and swampy areas of the region. As we travel into where Egypt, Mississippi was located, remember that General Smith and his Union troops were probably the most formidable cavalry force, certainly in this area, ever put together. General Smith became increasingly worried about General Forrest and the fact that General Smith was going to be late with his hookup with General Sherman and Meridian. General Smith's men were struck by how rich a countryside this was. As they moved down these very railroad tracks, they sent letters home talking about how they were going where no Yankee had ever been before. As they went along, they were destroying property and, well, taking cows and corn and anything to be used for the war. Egypt, of course, was one of the places that the Yankee troops destroyed as they moved down the railroad tracks. You'll notice as we drove through what I call Egypt proper, that nothing from that time period is left. I brought you to this spot to tell you the next story. There was a guy named Isaac Jarman. He was one of the richest planters in the area. Mr. Jarman's estate was located just a few miles from where we're at, but this gives us a good place to tell the story. We're not sure exactly how things happened, but we, of course, are sure of the end result. At some point, whether he, Mr. Jarman was hiding in the woods with his family or whether or not he was riding around with a friend, at some point he decided to defend his property. At any rate, Mr. Jarman ended up in the front yard of his home in a confrontation with some Union soldiers, and he, of course, was shot and killed. His niece, who was staying with him at the time, ran to his body and held his head in her lap so that it would not be stuck to the frozen ground as the Yankees burned the house down. We stopped here to tell a story because the German state doesn't exist anymore. This is a house was built somewhere around 1900, but it gives you a good place to use your imagination and know that Mr. Jarman would have lain in a front yard that looked much like this one. Everything was burned at his estate that day and in Egypt as well. One of the important facets to this story is the fact that as the Union soldiers were being distracted by all the destruction and plunder, they were becoming more late in their 
hookup, if you will, with General Sherman and Meridian. Okay, guys, this is the reason the Battle of Oklahoma happened. This is the Gulf Mobile and Ohio Railroad that uh, Suey Smith was doing his best to tear up. The whole reason that uh, fighting took place and Mr. Jarman was killed in his front yard not very far from here. I also understand that everything in the Egypt station was burned and there, and there just wasn't much left after this event took place. Let's look the other direction down the track. About this time, Grierson sent some Union troops toward Aberdeen to explore whether or not the Tom Bigby could be crossed there. They did not stay in Aberdeen long, nor did they cross the river there, probably because they found out that General Forrest was in the area. General Samuel Golson and his troops skirmished with some Union forces in and around Oklahoma as the majority of Union forces began gathering at Prairie. Then they moved toward West Point. And his orders to Grierson to come toward West Point, Smith expressed a little regret at all the death and destruction in the area, more about the fact that it, the delay it was causing, and he also expressed worry about the Sukatonja Creek. It's to the west, Tibby Creek to the south, and the Tom Bigby to the east. Water was high. General Smith was also aware, of course, that Forrest and his cavalry was in the area. This is Waverly Plantation. It's located on the Tom Bigby between West Point and Columbus. Colonel Bartow of Forrest Cavalry crossed the Tom Bigby River here and started shadowing the Federals on their eastern flank. Confederate General Forrest really did not want to fight a battle north of West Point. He was trying to draw the Union soldiers into the waters in and around the Tom Bigby so he could capture the lot. But on and around February the 20th, General Smith had established his headquarters in West Point. As Union General Smith established his headquarters in West Point, Colonel Jeffrey Forrest and his Confederates took up a position in and around Ellis Bridge. The Confederates had decided to defend the bridge at all costs so that they could move in and around the area as they needed to. During the night, General Smith had decided to retreat. He thought that his forces had become so encumbered by all the plunder that they had taken from local citizenry, plus the fact of the rising rock water and the fact that he just wasn't confident in the discipline of his soldiers because of the activities of the last few days. General Smith decided to cover his retreat with what he called a push at General Forrest that would allow him to escape back toward Oklahoma. This push is what we call today the Battle of Ellis Bridge or the Battle of West Point. This is a monument erected by locals at Ellis Bridge. After a sharp engagement at Ellis Bridge, the Union troops escaped back toward Oklahoma, being pursued hotly by the Confederate cavalry. If you're interested in driving around town like we're going to now, you need to purchase a copy of The Battle of Oklahoma by Brandon Beck. It has a nice little driving tour in the back of it. You're looking at the Oklahoma Library, which is where the driving tour and the back of Mr. Beck's book starts. You may be thinking, why in the world start a driving tour at a bank? Well, if you'll take a second to notice the clock on the side of the building, it's quite an interesting feature and reminder of Oklahoma's Civil War history. In 1930, this clock was given in memory 
of General W.F. Tucker. We'll visit with General Tucker at his graveside in just a few minutes. We'll try to give you just a little better view of General Tucker's clock. What an interesting way to memorialize somebody. As I was trying to get a good shot so that you could see the intricacies of the clock, this guy came out of the bank. His name is Charles Wizard Johnson. He's from Berkeley, California, and he now lives in Oklahoma. He is a blues musician and also a documentary producer. He produced a documentary in 2004 about the shake rag community in Tupelo called Blue Suede Shoes in the Hood. You can find evidence of this on a Mississippi Blues Trail marker located in Tupelo around their Chamber of Commerce building. We move down Main Street toward the Confederate Monument. The monument was dedicated in April of 1905, but somewhere in the mid 40s, the soldier on the top of the monument toppled into the street below. The soldier was, well, restored and replaced and returned to its spot on the top of its pedestal. The sun is not being very friendly to me today, but as we look up this side of the monument, I would like you to pay particular attention to the rifle that the soldier is holding. This is a bolt action rifle, probably more suited to a World War I doughboy. So of course, it is no longer an accurate representation of the Confederate soldier. Let's take one last look at the Confederate soldier monument and downtown Oklahoma. So much colorful history happening here throughout the years. We've moved past the Confederate monument to a bridge that crosses over the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. You're looking northward toward the old passenger station, which of course is no longer there. This area in 1864 would have been lined with cribs and granaries filled to the brim with things like corn and cotton. Of course, all this was burned by the Federals. We are looking southward now down the railroad tracks to, I think, an almost pretty picture. It's almost peaceful-like. It's crazy to me to think that war and so much death and destruction was brought to this town mostly because of these railroad tracks. As we begin to look northward along the railroad tracks again, I think this would be a good place to stop part one of our three-part Campaign for Oklahoma series. As we walk back and take one more view southward from the railroad bridge, I would like to encourage you to do your own research and see if you can learn something new about the Battle of Oklahoma. Big Daddy and I hope you've enjoyed this first part, and we hope that you'll return and see parts two and three. Thank you.